not just throw phrases, but also you have to back what you're saying to an investor. Funding a startup company, so startup funding 101. This is very basic, no fancy uh, slides because you'll get a lot of information uh, in short time. Uh, so feel free to stop me, um, but I'll try my best that it's not going to be legalese only, uh, but something you might take away from and um, I'll be happy to discuss anything you want to ask me later. So let's start or not. Um, small agenda, introduction, why am I telling you all this? Um, then the basics, how to fund a startup, what types of investors are there out there, some new types of, of uh, startup um, financing like crowd investing, STO, uh, IEO, TG, IPO 2.0. Um, and you're probably gonna ask yourself, what's best for me? We'll see if I manage to answer that. Um, last but not least, I will present some legal fuck-ups and how to avoid them. Um, let's say the, uh, those things you really need to avoid. So why me? Um, I'm an attorney at law, a senior associate at WSS Redpoint. It's a boutique law firm that specializes in startups, venture capital, and basically anything that is related to fintech, blockchain, anything regulated. So what I do there is I focus on corporate law, capital markets, and regulatory, um, and also venture capital, fintech, insurtech, regtech, like I said, anything that is um, in the focus of authorities, it'll probably land on my desktop. Um, I'm also quite familiar with blockchain and cryptocurrencies and also advise some STOs. And besides that, I try to think I'm an entrepreneur and a co-founder, although some in this room might tell that uh, the stealth mode is taking too long. Maybe the next time I will present something as a co-founder, actually. So this is just to give you a, a hint what I'm doing all day. Um, we'll give advice on foundation of companies, startup funding, like I said, STOs. Uh, also, I focus on topics like regulation, anti-money laundering law, know your customer, you know, all this. Um, and the basic uh, legal topics a, or legal matters a startup has to face within the first uh, few months after going to market, like business model structuring, terms and conditions. And also we could give you advice on the exit or a huge M&A deal and act as a legal department for startups. So, how to fund a startup? Um, basically, a startup could be financed from internal cash flows, but let's be honest, that's not going to happen within the first 12 or 18 months. Um, usually, uh, when we advise startups, there's um, often uh, subsidies uh, or promotional loans involved. You might have heard of programs like Exist or NRW Seed Cap, which is basically a programs um, where banks give you loans with uh, low interest rates or basically they give you a loan where other banks won't give you any. You might also have heard of venture debt or normal loans. Um, which is basically just uh, also a loan, but in a special situation. Um, venture debt is often granted by venture debt funds. And they used to, uh, they also do a due diligence like a business angel or venture capital investor would do um, and offer you special interest, but also require securities because uh, they will grant you a loan in a situation where a bank would not. And of course, there's equity. The founders or investors may also provide equity, which, is, uh, which can be a cheap, uh, a cheap funding or could also be a very um, expensive funding, 
when the startup is actually doing good. You might also have heard of crowd lending, crowd investing, and crowd funding, and basically an ICO, STO, or the newer versions of that is uh, what I'm, I used to say it's crowd investing 2.0. Uh, and also there's venture capital where um, investors will grant you um, most often equity for a minority shareholding in the company um, and there's factoring but let's not focus on that due to the uh, short amount of time. So when will a startup get funding? Most common in a funding round. But you can also um, tend for a public offering. And when I say public offering, it's uh, you address the capital markets, private investors or institutional investors on the capital markets. And I think the most prominent uh, example would be an STO, in fact. Um, because most of the startups I know, they are not eligible for, a, for an IPO, for instance. You could also do a private placement where you have certain investors that you address that you know from your network or, um, I don't know, um, maybe some founder knows somebody in his network who has money to give. Um, and they could also do club deals. Club deals are very common these days. Uh, usually venture capital rounds tend to be one million plus. Um, and since, I don't know, like a year or one and a half year, uh, club deals are getting more popular. Club deals uh, where business angel would pool their money and invest into a startup or invest separately. But um, yeah, like basically just pooling money and investing it. A few instruments you might know. Uh, when it comes to startup financing, you won't find securities unless it's a security token offering. We'll get to that later. But you might have heard of subordinated loans, convertible loans, or convertible notes. Uh, these are quite common these days. It's a loan where the investor is granted equity at a later point in time. And usually that later point in time is a future financing round. Um, this procedure has one significant um, advantage because you don't need to, to negotiate uh, the company's uh, evaluation. In a normal financing round, like a venture capital round, you have to argue with the investor how much, money, uh, how much percentage of the company he will get for a certain amount of money. When it comes to a subordinated or a convertible loan, you just say, I'll get the money now, and we'll see what the company will be worth, what the company's valuation will be in the next financing round. So basically, you postpone the valuation uh, negotiations. Um, it is often agreed that the investor who will grant you a convertible loan will get a discount on the future uh, financing round's uh, valuation. Let's, it's, let's say the next financing round will be based on a pre-money valuation amount in an amount of five million. The investor that granted the convertible loan will might ask for a discount of up to 30%. We also have participation rights, Genussrechte, uh, might ring a bell for some of you, and virtual shares of virtual interest and silent partnerships. These are just some instruments you might, you might find in a financing round. More important is who will give you the money. What types of investors are out there? Well, basically, the founders. If you're lucky, your co-founders will have money, will have deep pockets, and will be able to provide equity to fund the company um, in order to, let's say, uh, develop a, an MVP so that the future financing round will be at a higher valuation. Also, you will find in startup financing, you will often find business development banks. Uh, for those who are from the Nordrhein-Westfalen area, you might know the NRW Bank, which is a state-owned bank that grants 
uh, that, that runs actually the uh, CCAP uh, program. And most common, venture capital funds or venture debt funds. This is actually the type of investor most people would think about when discussing startup financing. You must not forget there's also corporate venture capital, strategic investors and company builders. It's a sort of um, a special kind of venture capitalists. Remember, these, corporation, uh, the, uh, these funds or these investors have a special interest that venture capitalists don't have. And that special interest is they have a strategic interest in the company. The venture capital funds have just one agenda, make more money out of the money invested. The corporate VC might have a different approach. So if you have a financing route where a corporate VC or a strategic investor will invest into your company, it is, in a lot of cases, this investor would also be your exit partner or the, the, the future buyer of your company. Last but not least, most of you will be familiar with business angels and family offices. Um, private investors like those you will find in crowd investing and of course customers and suppliers might also invest in your company. So corporation, uh, uh, yeah, corporations and joint ventures, um, it's a way to finance a startup and it's a way that most founders tend to forget. Some, I wouldn't call them investors, but you have also incubators, accelerators, and special purpose vehicles. Um, it's a way to fund a startup um, that involves also the granting of infrastructure. Uh, maybe it could be office, places, uh, 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 premises. Um, it could also be legal advice. The programs tend to differ much, so there's no real standard, but in fact, startups can uh, not just only be granted a, uh, like a, a small amount of money, but also save money f uh, f by being granted, yeah, like rent-free premises or um, free services. So money you don't have to spend, you can use to fund your, uh, the company yourself. <coughs> Last but not least, and probably one of the most important, FFF. Any idea how, what that is, what that might be? Fools. 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 <laughs> and the last F, those are the, those are the important ones. <laughs> yeah, friends, family, and fools, like people that are emotionally, emotionally easy to, blackmail, uh, to be blackmailed, um, uh, people that are easy to impress, people that are stupid to believe, I don't know, but usually people from your network that kind of, they see your puppy eyes and they say, okay, I will give you the 10 or 50 grand you might need. Um, so we got to know some instruments, we got to know some types of investors. How does a startup funding function? Um, how, what types of startup financing is there? When it comes to crowd investing or STOs and comparable uh, offerings, you just think of an IPO 2.0. So these kind of funding rounds um, are very special. It's, I, I don't think they are applicable to a lot of startups because you have to meet certain goals. You have to meet certain objectives. You have to have a special target customer. Usually those kind of uh, financing instruments do not work with B2B business models. When it comes to B2C business models, they have a, a huge advantage because you're not just getting money from your investors, you also do marketing. You can get the money from the people that will buy your product because if the people believe in your product, they will not just give you money, they would also buy the product. What you actually do is like a Basically, this is a uh, lean startup uh, approach because if you don't find any investors that are going to invest, you might likely not have any target customers you may sell uh, products to. 
Most important when it comes to these kind of uh, crowd investing or STO related uh, funding rounds, you need to have a solid story, an equity story people can relate to, uh, a story that makes people believe in you, believe in you as a team, believe in your product. And you, have, you need to have a certain readiness because uh, it's hard to, to get a funding uh, if you are still in a kind of white paper, uh, on a white paper level. It was a totally different stories, uh, story like one year ago. I mean, everybody knows the ICO market. It was like crazy. They, most of the time, the uh, entity wasn't even founded yet. And you had nothing but a white paper, nothing but an idea, uh, no MVP, uh, no, no funding of the company, no entity. So this was actually high risk and you could tell the scammers weren't uh, far away. So you might think crowd investing STO, this might be the way to go uh, because you have a, a, huge, um, a huge crowd to address. The thing is, it is also one of the hardest ways to fund your company because you have to focus on license requirements. You have to focus on additional requirements you don't face in, uh, in other sorts of financing rounds like anti-money laundering uh, laws. Uh, KYC processes, uh, prospectus requirements. So you have to comply with all these laws until, uh, unless you uh, want to end up in jail. And I do think, I tend to believe that a few people that run a, uh, an ICO will have a hard time to sleep nowadays. So it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, approach if you want to combine your funding with a marketing uh, 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 procedure or marketing um, scheme. But it's also a very cost intensive uh, way to fund your company due to these requirements. Because we're talking about costs um, in an amount of up to 100,000 euros. You also have like very basic legal matters you have to address before running the campaign. You have to take care of distribution. You have to comply with distance selling contract regulation with customer protection laws, like basic e-commerce related laws. Um, it doesn't, for the, when it comes to, to, to the legal aspect, it doesn't matter if you sell, um, let's say t-shirts or financial instruments via the internet the applicable law will basically be the same when it comes to uh, customer protection laws. Also, you have to meet data protection laws. And of course, it's a huge issue, corporate and contract law. You have to structure the financing deal upfront, and this might also be very um, cost intensive. And people tend to think that an ICO will actually be the cheapest way to fund your company as of now, Probably it's the most expensive one. Um, I do think that the blockchain technology will lead to lower costs in startup financing. Um, but as of now, you have to comply with all those ancient laws. You have to follow all those ancient procedures. And the uh, innovative, the disruptive approach is just on top. But I'm, I can assure you, it will lead to, a, uh, to, to more expenses when it comes to legal fees, when it comes to, uh, to, to other advisor fees. And also, please keep in mind that it's a very disruptive form of financing. Um, you will have to deal with authorities, like the, uh, in Germany, with the, uh, for instance, with the um, German uh, Financial Supervisory Authority, the BaFin. And they will take time to understand what you contemplate to do. And time is money. And if you're running out of money, this could be actually a very expensive way to fund your company because at some point you will be, yeah, you will need to spend the last cent just to keep the campaign running. And if you depend on the money or if you depend to have the money on a, in a certain uh, a point in time, you might have a bad awakening uh, because no one will guarantee you that the funding will be 
a great success. I mean, does anybody know uh, the BitBarn STO? I think they were going for like, what was it, 100 million? I think they got three or four. I think it was less than four. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, yep. Are there any platforms that take care of, let's say, GDPR, AML, KYC for ICOs? Uh, yes, they are. Um, actually, there are various platforms. Um, you will have to take a look, though, for those that also comply with the European law. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, and also, there are a lot of platforms. I don't think there's more than two that actually operate. They have to be but regulated, though, by yeah. the or whatever, yeah. whatever base. Exactly, because the platforms, uh, usually it's uh, considered a uh, brokerage of financial instruments. So they will have to meet uh, KYC uh, regulation. Yeah, yeah. But they take the pain away from you, at least. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And your money. <laughs> yeah. So we've heard a lot of information um, with respect to financial instruments, to invest, to types of investors, uh, to sorts of financing uh, or funding um, instruments. But you might ask yourself, so many options, what's the best option for my startup? And now comes the disappointing part, actually. I can tell you. Actually, when it comes to startup financing, it depends on the single individual situation. It depends on how many founders are there, what are your plans, how much money do you need, um, do you plan to, to make an exit in the future, uh, or do you want to grow old with your own startup. So, if anybody tells you that this is the way to go because Google did it or who, what else, uh, what, whatever company did it, uh, don't believe it. So you have to figure out what's best for yourself by asking the right questions and um, you will probably have to speak somebody who went through the whole process or who uh, has advised uh, such processes. Um, but most important, you have to figure out what you actually want. Now the fun part. The legal fuck-ups and how to avoid them. Preparation. This is just what I was talking about. Know your stuff. Know your startup. I mean, it's, it, it, um, it doesn't sound like a problem. But I often have people in front of me, founders, that don't even understand their own product. And you will figure out, if you ask the right, uh, the, the, uh, right questions, that they do, they do not know um, what the problem actually is they are trying to solve. They do not know their USP. They do not know uh, the market they are trying to address. And one thing that is really important and founders forget all the time is the team. For instance, a venture capitalist they will not just have a look at your solution for, or they will not just have a look at the USP. They will look at the team. If you have a good solution, if you have a market, they won't invest unless the team is the right team to do it. Because if there's no team that can actually bring the idea to the market, there's no need to invest. You won't get money from it. Um, one mistake that is, uh, I've heard like a thousand or I've seen like a thousand times and it kind of relates to preparation. I hear founders all the time saying, yeah, we have this kind of market and it's like, I don't know, 15 billion. And if our market share was just 1%, yeah, the thing is, Will you be able to deliver? Will you get the 1%? And if so, will you be able to deliver the product? Will you be able to serve this 1%? And I can tell you, within the first 12 months, probably not. So um, not just, uh, yeah, how to say it? Not just throw phrases, but also you have to back what you're saying to an investor. Because once you, the investor doesn't believe you, 
there's, uh, there's no way he will invest in your companies. Um, figures. Don't exaggerate. Don't forget the hockey, to hockey stick. Uh, also a legal fuck up we see all the time. Startups like to think big and I can relate to that. Uh, but it doesn't actually uh, meet the, uh, the investor's um, interest or uh, uh, expectation if you exaggerate your numbers. No one, no one will believe you. But also, don't think too small. The investor will, uh, will only invest, like venture capitalists, will only invest if there's a hockey stick. Yeah, if, if your sales are contemplated to go like this, don't ask a venture capitalist. You're asking the, uh, the, the wrong type of investor. You might ask a business angel. You might ask a, I don't know, a strategic investor. But you have to understand how the investors work, what their interest is, what their expectation is. Don't ask too early, don't ask too late. Sounds funny, sounds simple, but it's so true. Um, if you're running out of money, you won't be able to negotiate the term sheets. Because if you have a runway of just, let's just say, three weeks, the investor, I guarantee the investor will wait another three weeks and give you an offer uh, you can reject, but you shouldn't take. And don't ask too late. Oh, sorry, that was, and don't ask too late, and don't ask too early, because if you're running around in the market asking for money, or just pretending to ask for money, say um, we often have uh, founders that um, attend pitch, uh, pitches or uh, other events and be like, yeah, we have the startup, um, we need money, uh, we're basically doing this and that. And six months later, they start preparing a pitch deck, they start to address investors, they start to ask for money. And the investors will go like, wait a second, I've seen them half a year ago or a year ago at this pitch. And they were also asking for money back then. So nobody invested. What's wrong with them? And it can be the best business model. But the investors will think, this is fishy. Nobody invested yet. So something has to be, I, 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 something I don't see. But there has to be something wrong with this startup. So don't ask too early. Ask when you need the money. Don't ask too late, don't ask too early. And if you ask and you negotiate a term sheet, you better have at least three term sheets. You, you're not in a good position if you just have one term sheet to negotiate, just one investor to negotiate with. And I can't believe I, can't believe I say this, don't bring the lawyers to the table. I don't, I don't know what it is when it comes to lawyers, but um, <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, the uh, one thing we've noticed is um, it is better to brief the founders so that they're able to, to negotiate the terms, but not to bring a lawyer because especially the lawyers that represent uh, investors, they... Some might have an ego, uh, ego problem or some might just uh, try to, uh, to improve the, uh, the position of the investor. And what could happen is the parties actually agreed on the economic terms. But now the lawyers start talking. And now you're discussing legal terms. And although the parties have basically agreed on the, on the basic terms, things are getting off the road, off track. Because now you're discussing legal terms and you don't agree to them, and negotiations are over. So don't bring a lawyer, get briefed, go negotiate yourself, uh, and usually the investor will think, if, if it was a good negotiation, the investor will have the, uh, 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 um, uh, what is it, um, the confidence that you also bring your idea, idea to the market. We've signed the term sheet already. No contract negotiations begin. Worst situation you could say to a lawyer in a first meeting because negotiations are done. If you have signed the term sheet, negotiations are done. 
you basically agree to the terms that the final contract will contain. So most of the time there's not much going back. Um, so we, had, we would advise any startup, go to a lawyer with the first term sheet you receive, negotiate the terms there, and you will have a, an easy negotiation, or not an easy negotiation, but you will be able to negotiate uh, the terms of the, uh, of the final contract. But the final contract will be consistent with the terms you agreed to in the term sheet. So once you have agreed to the term sheet, bad situation if you uh, did not, uh, if you were not able to, uh, to implement all the, uh, the provisions that you've wanted, or all the terms that you wanted. Um, also classic valuation liquidation preference. I don't know if you're familiar with the terms. Um, liquidation preference? Uh, somebody might have an idea what it is? No? Okay. Liquidation preference is a preference right granted to the investor. So let's say if there's dividend distributions or if, they, if there are exit proceeds, the investor will get a share of it up front before any other shareholder will get their part of the, uh, of the exit proceeds or the dividends. It is contemplated that the, uh, that the investor thereby will uh, decrease its risk and will get basically uh, 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 repaid the investment you uh, initially uh, invested in the company. The thing is at some point in negotiations where you might not agree on a valuation with the investor, the investor might say, you know what, okay, I will agree to the high valuation, but I want to have a liquidation preference, maybe uh, with a, uh, like, let's say, six times the amount I've invested. If you agree to that, you need to know that you basically agreed on, another, on a, a different valuation. Because the liquidation preference allows the investor to participate in another re relation than the uh, participation in the share capital of the company. And if an investor gets more than it is entitled to according to the, uh, p uh, to the, uh, uh, um, to the share capital, to, it, to the share, uh, shares he holds in the company, it's basically just another valuation. Um, the rich friend. It seems like a story, but we've been there with our clients. The rich friend who offers money, um, and of course you'll take it because FFF, think about it. And at some point your startup was a huge failure and now comes the rich friend and wants its money back. What do you say? Wait a second. It was not contemplated that I'm going to repay you. It was not a loan. And the rich friend will be, of course it was a loan. Because it was just, I, I, I just gave you the money in expectation you will repay me and you will pay interest. So, if you get money from a friend, from family, whatnot, just make a contract. Avoid the stress of a, a huge fight with your best friend um, or, I don't know, mother-in-law, I don't know. Uh, but just make a small contract, clarify things, and you won't get in, into any trouble. Uh, kind of comparable situation, the friend that is a developer. And that did a great job on the MVP because he developed all the code and suddenly wants 50% of the company, which was not agreed, you think. What, what was also probably not agreed is that he's still owner of the code he developed. So, same story, um, make a contract, sort things out before you take money before you, uh, you employ uh, friends as developers or uh, other employees, make a contract, sort things out, avoid the stress. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, uh, the last two, those are funny ones. 
there's no law of letters from the BaFin, from the German Financial Supervisory Authority. So if you do an STO in Germany that does not comply with German law or anywhere else in the European Union, you will get law of letters from the BaFin. Well, basically, probably not law of letters, but you will get letters. Um, if the BaFin approaches you and says that you did not comply with the German or European regulation, you're in big trouble. Because most of the time, the managing directors of the company will be liable with their own personal assets and might also face criminal action. So when it comes to anything regulated within the capital markets, don't hesitate. Go to a lawyer, go to your friend who's an investment banker, I don't know. I wouldn't advise that, but do something, uh, get yourself informed and do not... Um, do not do just an ICO because everybody says it's not, there's no regulation. Inform yourself and avoid having a, uh, a relationship with the BaFin. And the last one, we'll make an STO worldwide. It's kind of the same issue. I've heard this actually a few times within the last few weeks. Uh, and it just shows me that the person I'm talking to has no clue what is actually involved to make an ICO, a STO worldwide. It basically means that you have to comply not just... I think there's a kicker. Oh. Um, don't make any mistake. It does not mean that you just have to comply with the, uh, with the, local, uh, with the local laws. And still, people believe that just because they have founded their company in Switzerland, in, uh, in the Crypto Valley, they kind of have a, I don't know, uh, like the, the wild card for doing an STO worldwide because they're based in Switzerland. No, it's not like that. If you address the capital markets in a certain country, the local laws will apply and you will have to comply with them because the local authorities, they don't care where your company is seated. I mean, I can do an STO in the US but the next time, unregulated, uh, and not complying with the, with, the, with the laws. But the next time I'm going into the U.S., the SEC will have a talk with me. And it's the same in Germany. So if you plan to, to uh, have a, an STO, if you plan to address investors all over the world, be sure that you will comply with all applicable law, and that might even be... Uh, various laws of, very, uh, of, of different nations all over the world. I know, it was a lot of information, short time again, but if you have any questions, inquiries, I'm happy to answer or discuss later. Um, in summary, because I know that it's going to be a big uh, topic, uh, past the startup stage, a company that is scaling up, how do the rules change uh, when it comes to you know, raising money to, uh, for the second stage of development? If it's a tech startup with a, or a, let's just say a startup with a scalable product, um, it's a bit standardized because you have, um, you will probably approach venture capitalists, venture capital funds, uh, venture debt funds, and that's about it. I mean, there are a few investment banks that will invest in a company, but until you have reached a certain point, uh, your investor will only be interested in a minority shareholding. He will not go for the control of the company because that pe founders sometimes don't understand. They think a venture capitalist will take 50% or more of the company, but that's not how a venture capitalist works. They fear that they, venture capitalists might even take the idea. That's not how a venture capitalist works. He, he doesn't know how to make money out of your idea. He just gives you money. He trusts the team to increase the value of the company. And at some stage um, where the valuation will be this high, uh, it's not interesting for venture capitalists anymore, but more for, let's say, private equity funds. So different type of investors. 
um, the uh, the uh, objectives will uh, objectives will change slightly, um, but it's let's just say there's a, there's a certain logic that will apply to a certain type of startup, and the logic will change depending on the uh, 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 on the situation or level or uh, life uh, position in the life cycle where the startup stands. How hard is it to get a classic investor in Series B when you did crowdfunding first? So you did a crowdfunding, mm -hmm. you got thousands of investors in your company, all with a little share. How do classic investors react to such a situation? I'd like to answer with a story. I've just today um, signed a, uh, a Series B. Um, it was um, let's uh, it was a bridge finance, uh, and there was a a nominee involved that represented crowd investing investors, okay. and it was a huge pain. And I nearly advised the family office we represent not to invest, because it was that much of a pain. Um, but the legal framework, the uh, the contracts, the at least the good platforms use. <sighs> Well, they are a pain. It's, it's, I think there's no venture capitalist or other investor that will be happy to, uh, to have um, a few hundred or thousand investors in the company. Although they're not, most of the time they, they will not participate uh, in equity, but just debt. But still, it's, it's a legal risk. If somebody feels like you've screwed him over, um, you will have not just one lawsuit, you will have a hundred. And a startup with a hundred lawsuits, it doesn't end well. But the funny thing is the investors don't seem to care as much as they did a few years ago. Exactly. And like I said, there's, uh, there's different structures um, that actually uh, were invented to, to kind of ease the pain for the investor. Like, you have a nominee, you have a, a representative, a contractual representative. Um, there's also uh, SPV models where the investors will invest in a special purpose vehicle, let's say via debt, uh, debt capital, um, and the special purpose vehicle will use the pooled money to invest into the startup company and actually get real equity. So the startup will just talk to one investor, and that is the special purpose vehicle. Funny thing, the uh, this kind of model uh, actually we've I think we've introduced it to the German market. Um, it was not as successful as the nominee structure. But the thing is, those kind of uh, companies that do crowd investing are usually not the kind of startups that are first choice for a venture capitalist. It's a rule of thumb. It's, it does not apply to every startup because there are startups that are quite interesting for uh, that usually. I mean, basically, if you do a crowd investing campaign, um, you're doing market, re market research. And if it, yeah. if it turns out to be, to be a good campaign, you actually can prove traction to your future investor. So it, I think it's a win-win situation. You just have to find the... Uh, a, uh, a yeah a good legal structure that will not uh, prevent you from getting future financing rounds um, you've said that uh, you don't need to coach a venture place too early right yeah <laughs> yep. um, but uh, actually what is the, the right time point from the point of view of product development i mean with a simple idea, you cannot just write the pitch deck and go to yep. the right? You need something more. It, it depends. Um, the thing is, if, you, if you're at the stage uh, where you need to finance your idea, or maybe the MVP, the, the minimal viable product, you don't go to a venture capitalist, because the venture capitalist will fund you scaling up. Mm -hmm. So you need to provide traction. You, have, you need to have a proof of concept. If you're in that stage, trying to get, uh, to get traction, to, 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 to get a proof of concept, 
you will most likely talk to business angels, uh, family offices, or maybe uh, like other seed investors, um, for instance, um, business development banks. And that's a different story. Um, you might approach them way earlier uh, than a venture capitalist. And one more question. What's the difference between B2C product and B2B product? I mean, what is the difference in choosing the, the investor? Um? Uh, good one. From my experience, when it comes to B2C business models, um, investors seem to be way more careful than they have been before because I mean e-commerce was it was first choice B2C e-commerce huge volume but small margin um, and at a certain level the investors had certain metrics that would apply to your business model so if you do not or yeah, if, if, if your business model does not meet the metrics the investors would not be interested in your company. As of now, um, what we've just learned or experienced uh, with respect to one startup we counsel, and it's a rather large startup uh, which had a series D financing round, yeah. Um, B2B business models go down in valuation. Uh, last year it was like, I don't know, um, 10 times, uh, 10 times of the, uh, of the, the um, what was it, annual st uh, sales or something, and now it's like six tops. Um, venture capitalists tend to, to go more for B2B models nowadays. B2B. Yeah, or B2B to C. Because the margin is Usually it's, it's higher than in B2C business models. And in B2C, like I said, you have a certain metric that applies. You need to spend a lot of marketing uh, expenses in order to increase sales. So it's, it's usually like, how much money can you, can you provide? And I tell you how much money I will make from it. Um, but the conversion is, in, sometimes the conversion is, is uh, rather bad. And in, in B2B models, it's like, you know your customer, you know what it, what it needs. Uh, he's, it is most of the time able to pay. There's no conversion issue. Um, there's no, no marketing expenses comparable to e-commerce. So, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a different approach. Welcome. The last one, IEOs. Uh, to be honest, uh, to a certain degree, I don't even see the difference. I mean, it, it just seems that it's a combination of models or, or uh, services you might need anyway if you try to have a um, an STO that is actually comparable to an to an IPO. Um, yeah, see the danger in pushing a token yeah. hardly to the market and then yeah. exit at the top, knowing from experience. <laughs> In my opinion, the, uh, the platform um, provides too many services, which leads to a certain uh, conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather have it the old-fashioned style, yeah. <laughs> where you have a, an issuer, uh, an intermediary. I know how, how people from the blockchain community think about intermediaries, but let's face it, it's not the, it, we are not we're not living in the future yet. So basically an SEO is old fashioned business just with a kind of with kind of a new approach. And you won't find a like this these kind of structures in old fashioned business. So it 
there's potential for scam. Let's say that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, which is an um, a security token offering, um, which is basically the issuance of a financial instrument, which has been tokenized um, on basis of the blockchain technology. What's the difference with ICO then? It's a... Mm, <laughs> even experts will argue. Uh, <laughs> There's actually no no uh, legal definition, but in an in an ICO, it's uh, it's an initial coin offering, uh, which is a derivate like directly from the blockchain, and an S an STO is uh, a financial instrument that is not uh, that is issued from a certain issuer. So you have one person that issues the uh, the financial instrument, whereas in an ICO, you have you don't have this singular uh, issuer, but the blockchain itself is kind of the issuer. Not necessarily. But there has been some like special standard for that. Uh, there's there's no real standard yet. I mean, um, there are a lot of companies that use uh, the ERC twenty standard, but. Um, since you may also use different blockchains, you could also uh, deploy different standards. And I think this is actually the trend nowadays, or will be the trend. But we'll see. Okay. Welcome. Okay. And I would say we can continue discussion with Bjorn also afterwards. Thank you very much, Bjorn, for this. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.